Life is about constant evolution. Always better today than we were yesterday. Welcome to The Only Easy Day was yesterday, the official Navy SEAL podcast. I'm your host, Scott Williams, and today we have with us the Command Master Chief of Naval Special Warfare Center, one Joaquin Martinez, a SWIC, and that stands for Special Warfare Combat Crewman, and uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you guys having me here. It's it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Yeah, it's an honor because he was in our very first episode. So we're doing a little bit of a reprise role. Uh, back then, you were not the CMC. <laughs> uh, but that was 2018, right? April 2018, I think we did our first episode, and he was here to tell us a little bit about um, SWIC. And that's kind of something we want to talk about today. Um, today's topic is my experience as a Navy SWIC. Um, a lot of people still don't know what SWIC is. And so we want to talk about that today. But first, let's start back in the beginning. How did you come into the Navy? What did you do in the Navy before you became a SWIC? So let, let's just start back in the very beginning. Yeah, I came in the Navy in 1992. Prior to me coming in here, I was actually working at a, at a pizza place. I was a, a young father, believe it or not, very young. And we decided to come in to the Navy. I had a cousin that was already in. He was an OT. There's most people probably don't recognize what that rate, rating is because it's long gone. He was an OT, an ocean system t- uh, systems technician, and he kind of inspired me to come in. Uh, so I decided to join. Initially, I was only on a two-year program. The two-year program they were offering at the time was apprenticeship programs, seamen, airmen, and firemen. So I came in for two years. And where was your recruiter? In Upland, California. So I'm from Ontario, California, oh, okay. and it's the next city over, so Upland, yeah. Upland, California. I went to uh, Chafee High School, and I graduated from there in, like I said, 92. But I, I had joined the de- uh, delayed entry program at the beginning of the year, yep. went to the delayed entry program, I was in it for about seven months prior to me coming in, in September of 92. So actually, uh, next week marks my 31st year in the Navy. Wow. So I've been in for uh, quite a bit. But really, that's what inspired me, my cousin coming in, and and uh, the fact that I was already a dad and I needed to do something. When I came in for two years uh, i got to the end of the year mark and i was up for e- what we consider e4 or third class petty officer and i had to make a decision am i ready to get out at two years with a wife and a kid or do i stay in a little longer and i i made e4 and decided to re-enlist for two years i think after that i i was uh, command advanced what we call notoriously advanced uh, program now i was command advanced at my three-year mark to e5 or second class petty officer and at that point i just um, I just felt like I had to stay, and it was kind of like no no turning back at that point. Yeah, I remember you had told us about the first time you had seen SWIC guys in action. Can you tell us about that again? Yeah, hearing about SWIC first was we had a chief, uh, Chief Othad was his name. He was on board the USS Nimitz. He had previously done a tour at SBU-12, and he used to talk to us about all the time on how they would you know, insert uh, or deliver seals off the boats and they would do different things. So he already kind of planted that seed. And it was probably about 96, 95, 96 time frame. We were actually in Port San Diego. I was on the USS Nimitz at the time. And we were on force protection duty that day. And I was a lifeboat coxswain. Back then it was a motor whaleboat. I was a coxswain for a motor whaleboat. And for those of you that are a little bit older, motor whaleboats were they are about 26 foot long and they basically went about seven knots max speed which is not very fast at all oh boy this particular boat had no reverse on it because it was broken and hadn't been fixed yet well the the force protection drill was the fact that we were going to have some harassment from some sbu guys back then now sbt and they came over and they essentially came to the ship and i had a guy hunkered down with an m14 you know blank fire of course which we absolutely did nothing with that uh, these guys came in with their cool high-speed boats. Uh, they started doing some blank fire with M60s at the time, 50 cows, and completely mm-hmm. obliterating us. And all I could do was just drive forward in a forward motion around the ship, just pretending we were guarding something. But I think once I saw that, I was like, wow, that's really what I want to do. 
Uh, I was also the. Uh, and they were doing better than seven knots, I imagine. They, yeah, especially, yeah. I think in reverse they did better than seven <laughs> knots. Just looking at them and the way they can make their jet wash fly up and just you know it was just really cool to see. And especially when they head out of there, I mean it was just a blink of an eye. They were there and then they they just were. were getting out of there probably making about 40 knots on the way out like those power boats you see in the races right? exactly yeah so it's very uh, very inspiring to see that and i think that uh further planted the seed but i i didn't bite off on until i decided what i was going to do with my military career to begin with so i think after i got off the nimitz i convinced my wife to come down to san diego on some shore duty after that which i kind of got closer to the to the goal and once I was on shore duty, I actually started training and putting a package to actually go to the program, and and uh, went to the program in 2000, and, and yeah, that's that's then. I actually had went back to when I got first orders. I went not back, but I went to Special Boat Team 12 was my first assignment. Wow, let's take a little bit more of a intimate look at the community itself. You've been a boat guide now for how many years? 23 23 years risen up through the ranks you've been through everything first tell me about the deployments uh, because we always get this question from from the people who follow us out there what do you guys do out there and Mm -hmm. and what's it like you know are you always on your boats and is it coastal is it river what is it so tell us kind of give us an overview of what you might do out there on an operation yeah First off, we have three three boat teams. The three boat teams, uh, one located here in San Diego, our West Coast, uh, co-located with the West Coast SEAL teams. We have one uh, on the East Coast, co-located with the East Coast SEAL teams, and one down south at SPT-22, which is located in Stennis, Mississippi. They are really assigned to the Riverine, such that they're focused on wherever they're required. That could be different AORs or areas of operation. We, on the West Coast, now are really uh, primarily focused on Pacific Central Command, and then you yeah. have the East Coast. I'd say you know Europe, European Command, Southern Command area of operations where they generally farm out to. You know the first deployment I went, I think I can highlight experience, if, and I think I think I'm going to highlight it because today we're actually getting back to where we were back then. I think the global war on terrorism changed a few things. I think NSW Naval Special Warfare really went to a f- full on land at say campaign swix never did swix usually stayed maritime where we're at we're talking in the philippines we're talking anywhere there was water we kind of stayed down there while seals mainly went to a lot of land uh, deployments so for my first deployment i was actually deployed on arc bravo which is uh out of okinawa i was deployed to okinawa so it it was a detachment and that was about seven guys at the time. I was in a rib detachment, and we no longer have ribs except at the training command. And we were deployed there. September 11th happened. We were co-located with a, a SEAL platoon. And after September 11th happened, we got, we got embarked on the ARG. It was the USS Germantown at the time. It was an awesome experience to be able to integrate with the fleet and a few other folks and you know meet people and kind of just share that mission. And we floated around the Pacific for about a month and a half with him. As, as a contingent out there, so didn't really necessarily go anywhere at that time. It wasn't until the following deployment we went to uh, CENTCOM when everything kicked off with, you know, the Iraq, uh, Iraq piece. Mm-hmm. But, but the, uh, the bottom line is that, you know, we were there co-located on White Beach. We were on land, boat stage there, aside from being embarked on a ship. Anytime we had to go somewhere, we loaded our boats. We, f- we fly for the most part. Or like I just mentioned, now with the Navy, or with the Navy, we can actually embark on them and then take us to wherever we need to go. I think there's a little bit of everything. There's a little bit of ship life that you may encounter. There's a little bit of, you know, living on land in, in, a, in a Ford operating base or some type of base that is temporary or with a host nation, host nation being other forces from, you know, different countries. It just depends on, on where your deployment's taking you and what the mission is at the time. So you could be operating out of like a foreign naval base or a foreign port. Absolutely. Um, or you could be operating off of, you know, one of the one of the amphibs mm-hmm. as part of a detachment with them. When you're doing these operations um, and you're away from that particular base, is it mostly coastal type operations? I'd say generally it's 
mostly coastal. Now, again, we do have a boat team that's dedicated to cl staying close to the rivers, tied to the rivers. Mm -hmm. And I think that mission's important and um, in working with a lot of foreign foreign uh, forces, that's main, their main thing. But I'd say coastal, I mean, if you look at the, the, the world, you know, I think it's most of it's covered with water. And so it's, it's safe to say that there's a lot of area to cover for, uh, for SWIX to cover. Uh, to actually more than probably more than we have capacity for to be quite frank so yeah lots lots of coastal now we know that swick drive around in these fast boats and they've got some nice big guns on them pretty cool stuff and we've always heard that they deliver special operations forces or or extract them as necessary but there's more to it than that isn't there yeah ab absolutely i think in today's age as well SWICs are, are have become more independent on mission sets that they are they're doing themselves. So it's not necessarily just about delivering other soft forces. It's really about completing missions using just a detachment and a couple augments, if you will, to that um, what we call you know we consider bolting on to the detachment to kind of help accomplish mi missions. So there's not a whole lot of integration at times. When it comes to what SWICs are doing, we're doing a lot of independent operations now, which is huge. I think if you look back from when I first came in, I, I don't think you would ever see that, right? It was always unified, unified, unified. And what I mean by that is you always had a SEAL platoon mainly and a, a detachment working together. Yeah. Now, we are still working towards that all the time. We are training all the time together, and we are making sure that we're, we're never – going to lose what we bring as a full package together it's important that we always maintain those ties but general i think because of the mission sets nowadays i think that we're looking more towards unilateral missions uh, with swix at this time and simultaneously you know other forces you know to include our, te our team guy brothers i mean they're doing their portion their piece of the puzzle as well their unilateral mission sets and we're doing the same thing yeah but we always train to come back together. So the deployments are about the same length as a regular Navy deployment, you know, six plus months. Yes, yeah, six plus months. I, I'd say that's that's about average. I think depending on where you go, you may find yourself in, in an exchange, a joint combined exchange training event somewhere overseas. And what that means is you're, you're actually just flying or, or going off to a particular location working with a foreign force mm -hmm. as an example there's different there's different um, smaller deployments or t uh, TADs temporary assigned duties as we call them that you might find yourself but for the most part six months is a normal deployment cycle so you mentioned earlier that you came into the Navy you were already a father so you've brought up a family in the Navy life and they've had a chance to experience for quite a while now the NSW community. Tell us a little bit about that, what that family support picture looks like. You know, it's, that's actually an important piece to me right now. My family, yeah, I've, my daughter been with me the whole time. I consider her, you know, the first dependent I actually had because I wasn't married till actually I attended boot camp. So she's the longest serving. And by the way, she's still a dependent. Um, she's married to a service member too now. So she's actually serving well, he, her husband's serving overseas, and they just got stationed out there a while back, so they're now experiencing overseas life for them. So I'm, I'm real happy to see my daughter has embraced, you know, and it's not about the just the Navy culture. What I love about my kids and what I love about what sometimes this community does, it's about the patriotism. It's about the willingness to serve. It's about the willingness to want to be out there supporting our troops at all times because it's an important aspect of what we do. I really appreciate how my daughter does it. I mean, she says something bad on TV, and she's calling me right away. Dad, did you see just what happened? Like, don't tell me. It's important to her that she just highlights how much of a patriot she truly is. Same thing with my son. He's one of my biggest supporters. I think that there's times when it's been hard, like working long hours, doing things, you know, at work that you just can't get away from. And, and of course, it's frustrating to families at times when you're like, man, you missed this, you missed that. And one person that's been in my corner, a sounding board to everybody, it's my son. My son has been a phenomenal sounding board to make sure everyone understands, like, hey, I've been with Dad. I've uh, been to work with Dad plenty of times. I see, you know, what he does day in and day out. I see whatever. So he can kind of 
uh, relate like what happens here to everybody and so he's a big supporter as well and as long as my wife as well as my wife too we've been married for over 30 years now uh not easy for anybody coming in you know it's not easy but you it takes a service member it takes you know it takes one person it takes the spouse to kind of work it out together we we talk about balance and mm-hmm. balance is is something that i think that is is something that you can strive for to have work and home life balance i've i've learned though over time that there needs to be a inner balance between like say myself or or a service member if you don't have that inner balance then then you can never truly find balance in my opinion and and i've i've had i've had help along the way which has which has been helpful to me so well as a command master chief you're you know now in the unique position of having that overview of the NSW family situation here for this command mm-hmm. uh, NSW center you have a special relationship with the ombudsman to the families um, so you understand the family picture even better than most do. How is NSW setting up its family support apparatus? How does that work? I feel like NSW in particular has one of the strongest preservation of the family enforced programs, I think, out of anybody. And I really believe we have key people positioned to actually help facilitate helping family members all around in conjunction with ombudsman and for those that you know may not know ombudsman is a volunteer normally a spouse of a service member at the assigned command or assigned unit that will actually volunteer to help be the uh, liaison between other spouses right it's a very important position and as a command mass chief i've had to work closely with mine i at uh, when i was in spt 12 i probably had the closest relationship i ever had with my ombudsman and it was phenomenal because i just knew that where I lacked in understanding how to support a spouse, that I can turn to my ombudsman, who can in turn turn to all the resources that we have in the life of the uh, Warrior Family Support Network is awesome. Yeah, because I can imagine there's all kinds of problems that crop up when you're deployed and she's at home uh, with kids or without, and the military thing is relatively new and... Um, she doesn't know what happens when, you know, something goes on with your pay and who does she turn to? Mm-hmm. Isolation is a choice, right? And, and if the ombudsman is reaching out to all of the new spouses at the command and saying, hey, just I'm here if you need anything. Here's my phone number. Call me if you have any problems, things you can't figure out. That goes a long way towards giving not only some relief to the spouse, but some peace of mind to the service member as well. So they can kind of keep focused on what they're doing on deployment. Absolutely. And I think that we, we do a great job as well. I believe in actually having what we call pre-deployment seminars and dinners right, right before. So we actually bring everybody together with all the resources. We brief them ahead of time. Hey, your service member is going to be gone for X amount of time. We're going to introduce all the resources we have. We, do that to make sure that it's fresh on everyone's mind who to turn to in the event that something bad goes wrong. At the same time, too, making yourself available as a command mass chief, as a leader in the community is highly important. I can't tell you how many times I've actually fielded calls from from wives, you know, husbands, uh, mainly mostly wives. But I think that there's, you know, what's important to some spouses at times may seem, you know, not nearly as difficult as things you know happen but to be able to help them out and direct them in the right thing i think it's important and really the 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 end game there the key thing to note is the fact that we're keeping the service members that are doing the deed out in deployment we're making sure that they are able to do their job because they're not worried about what's happening at home they're able to focus on what's happening out there because they know they have support out there, you know, back home with the kids, the wife and kids or the husband and kids. Well, and support also means social support, right? Absolutely. Keeping those activities going so that people don't feel that sense of isolation, that they're part of a command community that looks out for each other and their friends, you know, they, their kids uh, do things together. Really important to the mental health of the family that you leave behind while you're on deployment. Yeah, we have family readiness groups as well. And so separate from the ombudsman, family and readiness groups are designed to, to really bring families together. We do have family days to where we actually will bring everybody. It's like one big company picnic, if you will, if you're in the civilian world, 
we have bouncers, we have all kinds of stuff. And it's equally important to have those that are at the command present come visit as it is to have spouses that have deployed service members, right? Have them come in. So we're never leaving them out. Christmas parties, you know, like I said, family days, a few other events. We're always making the point to get the word out to them so they can be involved even if their spouses are deployed, right? That's an that's important part of, of NSW culture and NSW life. You're the first SWIC Command Master Chief for Naval Special Warfare Center. What's the best part about this job? Definitely what I talked about before, best part is, is taking care of people. I think that's where I thrive as Command Master Chief, and that's what I want to do first and foremost. And it's not just on the spouse side and, you know, taking care of families. It's actually career progression, too. And I think that's important to bring our sailors up. And, and granted, I'm a SWIC, and, you know, we have SEALs in NSW, but I think the combat service support ratings within our within our lifelines and you know that's all the above any any navy rating that's assigned to us i have a vested interest in in making them uh, progress up in the ranks right i feel that's where i also thrive because i care about their advancement their well-being all the above at the end of the day i I want them to exceed and excel where they can and just be the best best them uh, so to speak You've been around long enough now um, and seen a lot of changes at NSW and um, now even uh, the first women to come into the NSW force, into the SWIC community. Mm-hmm. What's, that, what's that been like? What are your impressions so far? I, I, well, for one, I was actually, and I think lad, the first, very first podcast I did, I was actually still sitting as the SWIC training senior enlisted advisor at the time. I was actually sitting that. I had the opportunity of actually seeing the first SWIC candidate go through at the time. And she deselected herself, uh, I think, in the first week of training. But I was, I was very Im- impressed to see where she was at the time. We all lacked somewhere. And I'd say, hey, if you look back at you know, the time I went to SWIC, I probably lacked in a few areas of physical fitness and a few other things, right? You know, I wasn't necessarily the fastest runner, swimmer, and all that. But I, what I saw was I saw an individual who actually was very good in the water and, and I'd say probably about 80% better than some of the, the other male candidates that we had in there, right? Mm-hmm. So it really made me realize or made me uh, reinforce my thoughts on like, okay, if anybody can, if anybody, it doesn't matter who can get through these pathways these or pipelines as we used to call them, then we need that person. We need that person's skill. We need the person's grit. You know, resiliency, we need it all. So I think that seeing the first two females uh, graduate from the, from the pathways, I think that is absolutely, you know, a great thing for the community. I think it provides a little more, you know, the, the, the buzzword diversity, right? And that's one thing. But I think it just reinforces that we all come from different backgrounds, shapes, you know, colors, creeds, no matter what. We're, we're all different, but we all have one goal in common and i think that just screams america to me so i'm uh, i've been very impressed to see some of the candidates come through here and their capabilities well i i know there was some some talk about how we would have to change the standards to accommodate women and all i all that i saw us do was go through and validate the standards to make sure that they're actually operationally relevant and not just sort of a you know bs thing that we throw out there for make it hard for people to do it they were they went through and made sure that they were all good and valid to what we actually need to do out on deployment because of that they found that they were you know basically gender neutral standards as well Uh, none of those required you to be a male when we lifted the ban in 2016 i believe it, it was a dod level and we were able to accomplish that here at nsw a little bit later since we made the necessary uh, modifications here, um, we started to see, it kind of trickled in at first, but we started to see the female candidates come in on on both sides, uh, SEAL and SWIC. And um, our first two graduates are are SWIC, and and now they're out um, in the teams, and they're at their training and and doing their thing. And And I think the community looks like it seems to have adjusted pretty well. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, going back to your, your comments about the looking at the standards and, and making sure that they're relevant, yeah, I was actually part of that you know, at that time. I was the the senior enlisted advisor at the SWIC Training Center, as I, as I noted. 
And so, yeah, I saw the process, and I think that we went through and ver verified and validated that the standards were general neutral, uh, neutral period. And I think that was uh, that happened, and there was no waiving of standards at all. Standards essentially, in some areas, they said, hey, maybe you should consider this, consider that. For efficiencies, that's about it, but nothing changed at all. So I think that I go back to this. If anybody can meet the standard, then they should probably be here provided they have the right character, the right competence, the whole nine yards. So let me um, go back to what I think is the most important question. And your answer, I think, will be satisfying to people who want to know more about SWIC. I want to talk about your personal experience in the teams. You've gone on deployments. You've been everywhere, different kinds of boats, different places. What has been your favorite moment, your profound moment in the teams. Describe that to us. I, I've had a lot of favorite moments. It's going to be hard to nail just one down, but I will say this. I feel, and I think it's safe to say it's probably true, is that SWIX are entrusted with a little more authority and accountability of what they do. SWIC leaders are actually tasked ultimately as chief petty officers to be assigned as what we call debt LCPO used to be detachment commander debt OIC that's a lot of authority and responsibility put on our, our chiefs unlike any other service any other command in the navy what that means is that our guys go out and they actually are responsible for the admin logistics and operations of a detachment at the chief petty officer level and I think for me being able to lead Folks overseas, alone and unafraid, as a chief petty officer, SWIC, is probably one of the best things I did. And I'd say, going back to my Mark V detachment commander, a.k.a. detachment LCPO tour, leading chief petty officer, was probably one of the best because I, I traditionally saw Mark V detachments and I saw a lot of, I'd say, pockets of personalities and pieces. And I always wanted my guys to be one cohesive unit. So we had 14 SWICs in one detachment and about seven combat service support ratings in there to include a couple CBs, some engineers, all that. And I think the highlight of that me was was just finishing the deployment after a two-year cycle and just having one last get-together and just all being able to get along, have fun and all that. But when I reflected back on the whole time, it was just awesome to lead people in a capacity as a, as a senior chief at that time, you know. And I hope that, that answers the question fully. But I'll say that um, the being able to lead an NSW as a SWIC has, has been awesome for me. Yeah, at the enlisted level. That's, at the enlisted level, that's yes. That's amazing. So talking about the mission of the center, which is training assessment, what do you think of this new crop of candidates that we've got coming through these days? Well, for one, I, I definitely want to put my faith in that we have a bunch of young Americans that are willing to step up and join our armed forces all around. And I don't care if it's Navy, Marine Corps, Army, Air Force. I'm really passionate that we do have young Americans still willing to serve. For me, this mission is important as well because I believe we are producing the next greatest generation in this country. I say that the greatest generation generally known as those that fought in World War II. There was a good amount of Americans that stepped up from all different Background stepped up to actually take the fight to Germany and to Japan uh, back then. I believe we're facing some things right now in our country that uh, could be bigger, could be huge, and I think that we need to uh, remember that we still need people to serve. I believe the people that volunteer to come here to this, to this training pathways, I believe that they are part of what's going to be the next greatest generation, in my opinion. I think we need a good amount of young Americans to actually join the military and armed services right now because they will be a part of something big and they should be SWIC. i i agree now don't get me wrong <laughs> um SWIC's definitely you know where my heart's at right i have a little bit of fleet time in me too so i understand the importance of the navy i think that um i love it but i definitely value what i've done as a SWIC, and i would have never done the things i have done or been to the places I've been if I was not a SWIC. So I'm very proud of that. Well, I appreciate you joining us here today. Uh, folks, that was Command Master Chief Joaquin Martinez. 
the Command Master Chief of Naval Special Warfare Center. I'm Scott Williams, and this was The Only Easy Day Was Yesterday, the official Navy SEAL podcast. There is nowhere to hide in Hell Week, gents. If you've been skating through bus so far, you will not do so any longer. Get your butt down. Get off your knees.